We have been discussing this, uh, this geometric representation of a Coxeter group, right? And uh, we talked about this last time. So, so here is the geometric representation of the dihedral group D5. And uh, what we said is, is that the way you build this is you pick a vector space with a basis alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha n, and an inner product so that alpha i, comma, alpha j has the correct value. And so we talked about the root system last time. And the root system is obtained by basically letting the group W act on the roots. So in this case, the group is generated by reflections S1 and S2. And so we're just letting the, the roots bounce around by reflecting them across these hyperplanes in every way possible. And so what we have been working on is basically to make a dictionary between algebraic properties of the group and geometric properties of this of this picture. So this is what we're going to keep doing today. So let me remind you the very useful result that I proved last time, which is that if you have an element of your Coxeter group and a generator, then the question of whether Multiplying W by the generator makes the word, makes the element longer or shorter, can be characterized geometrically. By seeing how the group element acts on the corresponding root. In this case it's positive, in this case it's negative. We proved this last time. It's very useful, and in particular, I use this to prove that roots were either positive or negative. Right? So if we go back to this picture right here, the roots are these 10 vectors right here. They form a, a regular decagon, and they split into positive roots and negative roots. The positive ones are the ones that are in the positive cone spanned by alpha 1 and alpha 2. And so they're the ones above this line. And the negative ones are the ones that are spanned by the, by the cone of negative alpha 1 and negative alpha 2, so they're the ones below this line. Okay. And as we will see, this division between positive and negative is going to play a very important role. Okay. Now, let me show you a very nice corollary of this. It's something that so far we have found quite difficult to prove. which is that we have this geometric representation, right? And so we, what we know so far is that it's a homomorphism from W to GLB, the invertible linear transformations on this vector space. But the question came up as to whether this is actually injective or not. In other words, does each group element get a different operation, get a different linear operation or not? And the adjective for that is faithful. So, so representations are called faithful if the different elements of the group get mapped to different linear transformations. So when I say faithful, this is a synonym of injective, but somehow in representation theory, the word faithful is the one that people use. And I should translate this to Spanish to make sure I understand. So this just means fiel. Okay. It's the corollary. And uh, actually, this corollary follows very easily from my theorem. So let's prove this. Uh, let's call this geometric representation sigma. And let's assume that <coughs> I mean, what we have to show is basically that the kernel is trivial, right? That 
the only thing that maps to the identity is, is the identity element. So let's, let's suppose that we have some element w that maps to the identity. So what that means is that when we take w and we make it act on a root, well, w is the identity, so it does nothing except for leave the root alone. Right? But we know that the roots are positive by definition. I mean, the, the simple roots are positive. Right? These are alpha i's are the simple roots. So this is clearly positive. And we know what that means. That must mean that when you multiply w by the generator si, you make it longer. But this is true for any simple root. This is true for any generator. So what I'm telling you is that I have an element of my group which becomes longer when you multiply it by anything, by any generator. And so of course, this must be the identity element. Okay? If it wasn't the identity element, then just write a reduced word for it and multiply by the last letter of the word, and you'll make it shorter. So the only element that has this property is w equals the identity. So w is the identity. End of proof. Okay. Do you have a question? How do we know that w acted on alpha i with alpha i? Just because I'm assuming that, that w maps to the identity here. And so what w does is nothing. If you up if you do W acting on anything, you just get that anything back. Okay. And so you see, this is, this is a very powerful way to go back from geometry to, to algebra. We get this almost for free. Okay. Any questions about it? So the next thing I want to do is I want to keep translating um, algebra things into geometry things. And I think you realize by now the importance of the length function. We keep referring to the length function over and over and over again. And it would be very nice if we can say what the length function means geometrically. Yeah. So that's the next thing that we'll do. Proposition. So this proposition has two parts. First, let's assume that I have a generator. Okay. And I want to figure out what this generator does to the positive roots. Okay. Now maybe, maybe let's, let's go to this picture and, and, and see what happens here. So, here, my positive roots are the ones that are above this line. And now, the generator, let's consider the generator S1. And let's see how it acts on the positive roots. So the positive roots are these five roots. And when we apply S1 to them, well, for one thing, we know that when we apply S1 to alpha 1, it's going to send it to minus alpha 1. And that's always going to be negative. In general, Si of alpha i is negative alpha i. So we know what happens with that one. Now, if you look at the other ones, you'll see that the other ones just get shuffled around. They just, SI sends the other roots, the other positive roots to positive roots. Okay. And we're going to show that that happens in general. So we're going to show that SI sends alpha i to negative alpha i, and it permutes the rest of the positive roots. Okay. So the only root that becomes negative is alpha i. That's one thing. Okay. But once we know that for generators, then we, it's very natural to ask about other group elements. So if, if I have some random group element, and I make it act on the positive roots, what happens? And what we're going to see is that the length of w is exactly the number of roots that become negative. Okay. 
So if you take any group element, then the length of this group element, which is an algebraic quantity, is the number of positive roots that W sends to negative roots. And this, this becomes a kind of a combinatorial geometric statement. You're just counting roots that have uh, some geometric property. And of course, it's compatible. The, these two statements are compatible because, what, because generators have length 1. And so what, what this statement is saying in part A is that a generator only sends one root to negative. And we know which one that is, tau pi. So let's prove this. Okay. In other words, A is a special case of B, but I want to prove A first separately because I'm, I'm going to use it in the proof of B. So first A. Well, we know that SI of alpha i. Actually, let me do this computation because, uh, I mean, intuitively we know that this is true, that SI is the reflection of hyperplane i, and so it sends alpha i to the negative. Now, let's remind ourselves, how do you prove this statement? <coughs> you, we have to use the formula for what SI does, right? SI of alpha i, what that does is that it, it takes alpha i minus 2 times the inner product of um, alpha i comma alpha i alpha i. That's what you get when you plug into the formula. And then the inner product of alpha i with itself is 1, and so this is minus alpha i. We did this before, but I want to make sure that you that you understand we we're actually making a computation there. Okay. So we know that alpha i becomes negative. Now what I need to do is prove to you that the other positive roots stay positive. So let's consider some positive root, which is not alpha i. And so as i should take this guy and send it to something positive. Now, what does it mean to be positive? Well, what that means is that you are a linear combination, a positive linear combination of the alpha i's. So so you have something like this. Say Now, what is SI of alpha? Well, we have to apply the formula. It's alpha minus 2 times the inner product of alpha comma alpha i alpha i. So we have to prove that this is positive. Now let me just plug this in again, C1 alpha 1 up to Cn alpha n minus 2 alpha alpha i alpha i. Okay. Now if you look at this expression, you'll realize that basically alpha and Si alpha have almost the same expression as a linear combination in terms of the alpha i's. The only coefficient that's, dif that's different is the coefficient of alpha i, which here was ci, and here it's going to be ci minus this. But all the other coefficients, cj, for j different from i, are not going to change because you're just subtracting an alpha i thing here. Okay. What happens then? Well, the thing is that, I mean, these, were, these guys were all non-negative. Now, I only changed one of them. 
And so how can this become negative if, if these guys were all not negative? Let me, let me say it more clearly. So we look at this expression, and, and we have to be able to find some cj which is actually positive. Okay. One of these guys must be positive because this is, a, this is a linear combination where something is positive. How do I know that something that is not i is positive? In other words, how do I know that alpha is not just a multiple of alpha i? You see what I'm saying? I'm saying this is a positive, a, a non-negative linear combination. And all I'm saying right now is that this cannot look like 2 alpha i, or 3 alpha i, or 7 alpha i. Why is that? The, the thing is that all, all the roots have length 1, remember. So alpha i has length 1. If you multiply it by something positive, it, it still has to stay being length 1. And so the only, the only positive multiple of alpha i that has length 1 is alpha i. But alpha is not alpha i. So that means that this is not just something times alpha i. There's some other cj that is positive, And you didn't touch that cj. So that means that at least one of these coefficients is strictly positive. But we know that roots are either positive or negative. So either all of these guys are non-negative or all of them are non-positive. If we find one positive one, then we know that this is a positive root. Cj occurs in Si alpha. And so Si alpha must be a positive root. And so that, that shows to me that if I start with some other positive root and I apply Si to it, I get, a diff I get some other positive root. Okay. Now, let's think about this a little bit carefully now. Because I'm here I'm claiming something a little bit stronger. I'm not, I'm not just claiming that Si sends phi plus to phi plus, I'm actually claiming that it's, that it's a permutation. Okay. So how do I make sure that this is a permutation? Yeah. In other words, I mean, just like here, in this example, we have, what does S1 do? Well, it, it sends alpha 1 to negative alpha 1, and then it takes these four guys, and it permutes them. Okay. It sends this one to this one, this one to this one, this one to this one, this one to this one. And so to show that this is a permutation, I have to show that it's, it's injective and it's surjective. So how do I show that it's injective? Well, just suppose that Si sends alpha and beta to the same thing. How do I prove that alpha is equal to beta? There's a very easy way to do that, which is to say, remember that Si, I mean, I can just apply Si to the left, right? But I know that Si squared is the identity. So this is alpha. This is beta. Okay. And how do I show that this is surjective? Well, I have to show that any positive root which is not alpha i can be written as Si times a positive root. So what should I put here to make this, uh, this equation true? I have no choice, right? The, the only thing I can put here to make this equation true is Si alpha. And because alpha is positive, Si alpha is positive. So that shows that alpha is the image of this root under Si. Okay. So that proves part A. Now let's prove part B. So, 
So we have to show that if I, if I take some group element and uh, I don't know, let's, let's actually choose a group element. Okay, so for example, the group element G equals S1, S2. And let's see which roots become positive, sorry, which, roots, which positive roots become negative when I apply G to them, okay? Now, what is the effect of, of reflecting across S1 and then reflecting across S2? For example, let's see where alpha 1 lands. Sorry, this is the other way, right? So if, you, if I want to know what S, S1, S2 of alpha 1 is, then I have to apply S2 first, which sends me to this one. And then I have to apply S1, which sends me to this one. So this guy lands here. So what's G? You, you guys proved what happens when you, when you apply two reflections, remember? You guys proved that if, that if you take two reflections, if you reflect across one and then across the other one, what you get is just a rotation by twice the angle between the reflections. And we see that alpha 1 landed here. And this is twice the angle between the two reflections. Okay. So this is rotation by, what angle is that? Uh, this is pi over 10, so it's twice that. Pi over 5. Okay. And so now I want to ask myself, OK, which ones are the roots that are positive, and when I apply G to them, they become negative. So which ones are they? Well, we have to figure out which, root, which roots that are here, when I rotate them by, by pi over 5, they land down here. And which ones are they? Well, it's this one and this one. There's two of them, which is good, because this guy has length 2. So you see, this is what this statement is saying. So these are the, the two roots. that G makes negative. Is it 2 pi over 5? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this angle is 2 pi over 10. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's prove this statement in general. Now, seeing that the way that we like to prove a lot of these things is, is by inducting on the length. And this is especially likely since we're proving something about length. So let's induct on the length of w. The initial case is when the length of w is 1. Well, I guess the initial case is when the length of w is 0. The length of w is 0, and w is the identity. And so the identity doesn't take any positive roots to negative roots. So this number is 0. So for, L, for 0, it's true. For length 1, it's also true by part A. So length 1 and 0 are OK. Now let's suppose this is true for length less than the length of W. And so then we, we do the, the argument that we've made already a couple of times. Okay. We want to prove the statement for w. We want to do it by induction. And so the way that we apply induction is by, is by bringing w a little bit lower. And the way we make w a little bit lower is by multiplying by a generator. So we're going to find some generator. Find si such that. WSI is shorter than W. And that means that I can apply my induction hypothesis to this guy to get to this guy. Okay. So by the induction hypothesis, there are this number roots 
which are positive such that W S I sends alpha to a negative root. Okay. This is the induction hypothesis. Now, what I need to do is prove that there are L of W roots that W sends to negative. Okay. Now, how much is L of W? It's this plus 1. And so probably what I want to do is use these guys to find a bunch of roots that W makes negative. So what root does W make negative? If you look at this equation, you kind of have a natural choice. Okay. So well, the question, of course, is whether, I mean, so this guy is such that W sends S i alpha to negative. Okay. So W sends this root to a negative root, but the question is, is this a, a positive root? Am I allowed to count it? So is S i of alpha a positive root? Well, the thing is that I know how to characterize that. S i of alpha is positive if alpha, where did it go? I mean, this is positive, right? Why? Which which roots does alpha send to ne does S i send to negative? Only alpha i. So the only issue would be if alpha i is here, then it will become negative. So can this guy be alpha i? No, because if this guy were alpha i, then this, this would be not true. Because we assume that the length of w s i is less than w. So we had this number of roots that were positive and were made negative by, by W S I. And what we did then is we find this number of roots that look like this, that W made negative. Okay. So that means that we're missing only one root to account for the, for the difference between lengths here. And which root do you think that is? The thing is, W S I is less than W, and we know what that means okay. by by this statement over here. We know that if W S I is less than W, that means that W sends the positive root alpha I to a negative root. So W sends the positive root alpha i to a negative root. Okay. And we already checked that alpha i didn't appear on this list. So this is really an additional root. Okay. So we found this number of roots plus this one. And that means that we have found this number of roots with the property that we need. But this is length of W. And it's and it's very easy to check that that if you that these are the only ones. So if you have a, a root that W if you have a positive root that W makes negative, it's it's you just repeat this argument and you'll see that it had it has to arise from this construction. And so this this concludes that proof. Now I should I should tell you something, which is that one of the homework problems is basically a strengthening of, of this result. Okay? So this result tells you that the number of positive roots that W sends to negative roots is the length. 
And in the homework problem, there's a, there's a question, in the homework, there is a question where I ask you to tell me exactly which roots they are. I mean, I don't ask you to tell me. I tell you which ones they are, and, and you have to prove to me that this list of L of W roots that I give you are exactly the positive roots that become negative. Okay? And so if you want to solve that, that homework problem, that one way of doing it is just to look very carefully at this construction, and, and then it'll, it'll fall out from what we did. Okay? So that's a hint for that problem. So that proves this nice geometric characterization of the length. Okay. Let's continue relating geometry and combinatorics and algebra. So let's talk about roots, because the way that I define roots, they look like they're very geometric objects. Roots are vectors. And so now I want to bring that back into algebra and figure out what roots mean algebraically. And so this is basically the relationship between roots and reflections, algebraic reflections and geometric reflections. And the point is that there's something, so remember that we started with a Coxeter system like this. And then I define this set T, which were the, the conjugates of the generators. And I call these reflections. Okay. And that, should, that must have sounded like a very mysterious name to you, because if I, if I give you something like this, that doesn't look like a reflection. That looks like some algebraic thing. Okay? And so in fact, I want to call these algebraic reflections. But what do I want to do now? What I want to do now is think the following. Well, each one of these guys is a group element. Right? We have the, the simplest group, group elements are the generators, and we know how generators act. They're just reflections in my geometric picture. Now the next simplest elements of the group are these reflections, and they're group elements, which means that they also act in that picture. Okay. And what I want to do now is understand how they act. What, what does an element of this form do geometrically? So how does how do these act? And I think you can imagine what the answer is because of the name. The reason these are called reflections is because when you see what they do geometrically, they reflect. Okay. Maybe it's worth it to do an example here. So let's take some reflection here. Like S1, S2, S1. And let's figure out what that does geometrically. How do I know that S1, S2, S1 is a reflection? But remember that the reflections, I mean, basically because it's W, S, W inverse, or we talked about how you can also think of reflections are as the guys that you can write palindromically. Okay. So what does S1, S2, S1 do? Well, let's see what it does to alpha 1. I apply S1 to it. And I land here. I apply S2 to it, and I land, don't let me make a mistake here, please. Here, right? 
and then I apply S1, and I land here. So this guy right here is T alpha 1. Okay. Now from that, I still cannot tell what, it, what, this guy is, what this operation is doing. Let's see what it does to alpha 2. And again, don't let me make a mistake. Alpha 2, I apply S1 to it, and it, I land here. I apply S2 to it, I land here. I apply S1 to it, and I land here. You know, lose this part. This is T alpha 2. So what does T do? It sends alpha 1 here, sends alpha 2 here. I think you can see there's an axis here. And T is just reflection across this axis. So this is what T does geometrically. And that's good, right? I mean, that's a, that's a good thing because we talked about how, I mean, I draw these pictures, and, and if I'm standing here and I think of these as mirrors, then I really only have two mirrors. But then when I look, I see all these other mirrors, which I haven't seen yet. And those other mirrors are exactly the algebraic reflections. So this translates beautifully, I mean. So let's prove this. So let's see what T does to B. Well, what's T, first of all? Let's say that T is W as I W inverse. And let's see what T does to some vector. We want to prove that what it does is a reflection. Well, this is, by definition, W as I W inverse of B. OK. Now, generally, what we, what we want to do now is, is plug in. But the problem is that we don't really have a formula for W, how W acts. We only have a formula for how SI acts. And if we want to really write out an expression for this, we would need to write W in terms of generators and get a huge mess. So let's pray that since we know how SI acts, let's just plug that in and let's pray that the calculation works out and we don't have to go, go and mess with these generators for W. So I leave W alone. And I think that SI is acting on this stuff, and I know what SI does. What SI does is that it, the formula is W inverse of B minus 2 times the inner product of W inverse of B times alpha I. what I get when I plug in SI of something. Okay? And let's hope that this simplifies. So there's a little bit of simplification here, because here I get WW inverse of B. So that is B. Right? Now, remember, th this is just a number, right? The, the inner product of two things is just a number. So I can bring this w into here and not affect anything. So I get this. Does that look like a reflection to you? It's, it's close, right? I mean, it, it has the v, it has the minus 2, it has the inner product. But remember that the reflection with respect to some thing beta is v minus 2 inner part of v comma beta beta. So it looks almost right, but not quite. Because 
what I would like is something that looks like v comma something, where that something is the same thing as this something. So really what I, what I would have liked is to get the v here, the w alpha here, and the w alpha here. And then it would look like a reflection. Right? Then it would be just the reflection across w alpha i. So there you go, proof. Well, <laughs> almost, except that I, I better prove to you that these things are actually equal to each other. But before I prove that to you, I hope you, let's get you to agree with me that if I prove that these two guys are equal to each other, then this really does look like the formula for our reflection, where the reflection is across the hyperplane perpendicular to w alpha i. By the way, what is w times alpha i? Al alpha i is some simple root, and w is just something. You take alpha i, you apply some w to it, and it sends you to some other root. So this is just some, some root. And that's something that you may or may not have noticed in this picture over here, which is that I showed that my algebraic reflection t really acted as a geometric reflection in this picture. But we didn't talk about what the vector was that generated this reflection. So what is the vector that generates this reflection? Well, you see it's exactly this vector. And this is a root. Yeah. Which root is this one? Well, according to what I'm doing over there, it should be, you know, it should be W alpha i, where W is this and alpha i is this. So this should be S1 of alpha 2. So again, let me pray that I did everything correctly. Alpha 2, when I reflect it across S1, I get this one. So this looks very plausible as soon as I, manage, as soon as I prove that equality for you. Um, but let's see if I have time to prove the equality. But I want to get to my point, which is the most important thing. My point is this. My point is that we have basically that the action of the algebraic reflection W S I W inverse, and I'm thinking of this as T, this is basically the geometric reflection by root W alpha i, where this is alpha. Okay. So, what I define as algebraic reflections, you can think of as geometric reflections. And so, what that does is that it, it gives us a one to one correspondence between algebraic reflections in W, geometric reflections. in the geometric representation and roots, positive roots. And this is a very powerful dictionary. It tells you exactly what positive roots mean algebraically. They're just the reflections that we have been, talk been talking about this whole time. So by, by finishing this computation, I will have proved that an algebraic reflection is a geometric reflection. And there's, there will be one statement missing, and this is another one of your homework problems, which is that if you have some group element that happens to act as a reflection, then that's no accident. The reason that it acts as a reflection is because it is one of these guys. 
So part of your homework will be to finish proving this correspondence. So let's, let's uh, finish by proving this, this statement. The statement that I'm making is that, let me, let me generalize it a little bit. The statement that I'm making is that if I do w, u, and w, v, is the same thing as u, v. In other words, if I have an inner product, I can make w act on both sides, and I'm not going to change the inner product. And you see this is exactly the same thing, because here I have an inner product, and I'm saying what I want to do is make w act on the left, on both sides, and get the same inner product. Okay. So I have to prove this for all w in w, and all u and v in my vector space. But you see, if, if I prove that this is true for generators, Then whenever I have something like this, I will be able to multiply by a generator on the left. And then I can multiply by another generator, another generator, until I build up all of W. So if I manage to prove it for generators, I'll be done. Okay. And I think, that actually, this is a fun computation. You should do it. It's another one of these things where I don't want to spoil the fun for you. What are you going to do? The thing is, you have formulas for this thing. right? So this is u minus 2 times blah, 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 blah. And then v minus 2 times blah, 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 blah. And you should just take this thing and compute until you get u comma v. It might seem kind of magical. In the end, everything kind of cancels out beautifully, and you get the right answer. But it shouldn't be too surprising, because what I'm saying is that, when you remember this kind of measures angles. And what we're saying is that, is that w acts nicely. So that it doesn't, it doesn't really, it's transformation that, that kind of preserves the angles and distances and everything. So prove this and then, and then we'll be done with this correspondence. I guess you prove it and, and put it on the form. I didn't go to the other